Thank you for coming today, and please spread the information around that you hear today. People don't know what they don't know. And if you're going to learn today so you can help spread the information, please check your cell phones and make sure they're turned off. We would like to thank the Santa Barbara Public Library for co-sponsoring these forums with our League of Women Voters and providing Jen Limberger to, serve, to be the staff to manage the audiovisual and help us out here every time we're here. Thank you for Gary Atkins for uh, sound system for doing the sound and Sylvia Uribe with Translinguistic Services who is simultaneously translating as we go through the program today. If you need to hear this or want to hear this in Spanish, you can sit next to her and hear it in Spanish today. This forum is being televised by TVSB and will be available on channel 17. You may check on their website, go to On Demand and to Video. There you can check their schedule and see where our video is being shown in English or Spanish. It is also being simultaneously streamed on Facebook and can later be viewed on our website, lwvsantabarbara.org. These videos stay on our website and all our past, not all, but forever, but our past couple years are on our website. Go to the bottom of our website page and click on YouTube and it will take you to our videos. If you are interested in learning more about our league, please talk to Bev King. She's at the membership table at the back of this room. I want to thank the committee for organizing this forum. Dennis Bosnich, Deputy CEO, County of Santa Barbara, who will be a moderator. Emily Allen, Co-Chair of Social Policy Committee. Jane Benefield, Publicity, and Vijaya Jamalamaladaka, who is Vice President for Program and Advocacy. Also, thank you, Suzanne Brothen and Bonnie Jensen for hospitality. We handed out index cards so you can write questions to be looked at, at after the presentations. Our next forum, and the last one for this season of forums, will be on climate change. It will be the third Wednesday, April 17th, called The Climate Crisis, Our Community, Sea Level Rise, and Health Impacts. Be sure to watch for our constant contact updates and our Santa Barbara printed media ads. At this time, I would like to introduce Joe Allen, who will present information regarding the League's involvement in Census 2020. Oh, before I introduce him, I want to make a couple of announcements. On Friday, we will have a discussion group. We have three discussion groups a month. This will be the last one for this month at Cafe Stella. If you're interested in attending, contact Vijaya, RSVP. Also, we have a political book club. It's called Overbooked, and we are reading American Sick and American Sickness, and we'll be discussing that on April 9th. And finally, Earth Day is coming up in April. That's why we're having climate change as a topic to coincide with Earth Day. We will be having a table at Earth Day, and we would love to have volunteers for two hours a time. Um, it's April 27th, and we will be there all day, like 10 to 6. And you can sign up, put your name and phone number or um, email, and Bev will help you do that at the back table. Now for Joe. Joe Allen is now retired after a long legal career in civil and criminal law. A 35-year resident in Santa Barbara, he's had his own practice, was senior deputy county counsel supervising judicial research attorney for the Superior Court, and a deputy public defender. During his 14 years in Mendocino County, he served as both chief public defender and elected district attorney. Allen, who graduated from UC Berkeley's Bolt 
Hall School of Law in 1970, taught at the Santa Barbara and Ventura Colleges of Law. He has a master's degree in history from the University of Illinois. Welcome, Joe. The state and national League of Women Voters have both joined in two uh, potentially precedent-setting constitutional lawsuits around the question uh, that the government has proposed asking this year in the national census about citizenship. For a little background, the census as we know it was established in the Constitution of 1787. From the Declaration of Independence in 1776 until the Constitution was ratified in 1788, there was no national census in the United States. Because each state had one equal vote in the National Congress, there was no need to know how many people were in each state. It didn't make any difference. But the states kept track of their own populations for taxing purposes and for apportioning their legislatures. The framers of the Constitution created a House of Representatives in which the states were not equally represented but would be represented according to population. The enumeration clause found in Article I, Section 2 of the Constitution provides that the first Congress will order a census and then there will be a census every 10 years. The first census, in fact, was set up by the first Congress in 1789 and was held in 1790, and they have been held at 10-year intervals ever since. The next one is next year. The importance of the citizenship question uh, is that a substantial body of expert opinion, which the League at the state and national levels believes to be accurate, holds that asking respondents to tell the citizenship of the person answering the census questionnaire and the citizenship of all other people living in the household will cause many thousands of people in immigrant communities to simply refuse to answer the census. This will cause an undercount which violates the precepts of the enumeration clause which stated and has not been changed in 250 years, stated that every person in the United States was to be counted. Men, women, property owners, the property less, slaves, visitors to the country, the only exception being Indians not taxed. Whatever that may have meant in 1787, Indians get counted today and have been counted for 150 years. The reason it's important is that not only the apportionment of the House of Representatives, but the distribution of federal money depends upon the census numbers. As a practical example, if California had an undercount we have 40 million people, okay? If our census number was one million short, which could easily happen, that's a little over 2%, right? One million short and we would lose between one and two members of the House of Representatives from California, okay? And billions of dollars in federal funds which track the census numbers because the census numbers tell the federal government how many people there are and therefore how much is the federal government needs to send to the state for education, for roads, for schools, for hospitals, for medical programs like uh, Medi-Cal. So the League of Women Voters joined in two federal lawsuits, one in San Francisco and one in New York City. 
challenging the attempt by the federal government to include the citizenship question. There has not been a citizenship question since the 1940s. Both of those cases, the federal court decided that the federal government was violating federal law by including this question. The decision came first in New York City a couple of weeks ago. The judge in San Francisco made the same finding and additionally found that the government had acted in bad faith that it had tried to mislead the federal court about why it wanted to ask this question and where the question came from. The Supreme Court, in an unusual move, has bypassed the courts of appeal and has taken direct jurisdiction over both of these cases. They will both be heard in the Supreme Court this spring, and it is expected the Supreme Court will decide this question before June 30th of this year, because the census questionnaires, with or without the citizenship question, are to be printed in August of 2019. Thank you. Let me introduce Dennis Bozanich, Deputy County Administrator, uh, graduate of UCSB. He has been in public administration for 19 years and has been working uh, for the County of Santa Barbara in various capacities beginning in 2011. Well, thank you, and, and I appreciate, Joe, uh, your introduction and context for this discussion and forum today uh, with our panelists. Um, regardless of what the Supreme Court decides, we have to be prepared to count every single person. We can't bet or guarantee what the result is gonna be in the courts, and so we have to begin strategizing how we count every single person, whether that citizenship question is there or it's not. And that's really what today is about, and I'm so glad to have the panelists as well as our next speaker with us today to really present to you what we're having to look at as we begin to think about how do we count every single person in the state of California during the 2020 census. We have just over a year. Census day will be April 1st, 2020. Now is the time to prepare. With us today is uh, Quintilia Avila, who is the regional program manager for uh, the, and Southern California lead for the California Complete Count uh, Census 2020 program. Uh, she is based in Los Angeles, and Quintilia was a team member of the California Complete Count Census campaign in the year 2000, so she's been here before a couple of times, not her first rodeo. Quintilia uh, brought knowledge of historically undercounted, historically undercounted populations, such as immigrant communities, to the state's census outreach efforts. As an immigrant herself, she understands the fear some Californians have of government. Quintilia brought experience and knowledge as a research administrator, managing more than $5 million in medical research grants for the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. And during her 15 years at USC, she honed her experience, expertise in project administration, resource and staff management, people skills, which is good, cultural competence, and including complete biliterate capacity in Spanish. Quintilia received a bachelor's degree from the University of California at Santa Barbara and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Southern California. And it's my pleasure to uh, bring uh, to the podium here Quintilia Avila. Thank you so much for having me. What an introduction. So, uh, good afternoon, my name is Quintilia, and I'll go kind of quick, because Alan, was it Alan? I forgot if that's his, Joe. Joe Allen just did a great, uh, kind of give you a big context of why this is so important. So, uh, the US Census Bureau wants to ensure that everyone is counted once, only once in the right place. 
These are some of our challenges and opportunities. We have the very first digital census for the very first time in the U.S. Uh, history of uh, census taking. We will have it digitally. So 80% of the population will be filling it out by uh, computer, laptop, online, phone call, uh, and then the other 20% will be doing it on hard piece of paper as we've been used to doing. And people will be self-reporting their identification. The U.S. Census Bureau has limited funds this year in comparison to the California Census. The U.S. Census is charged to enumerate. They are the actual counters. They develop the questionnaire. We as a California Census are doing the education and outreach to all uh, hard to count communities. And because we have a very diverse population in California, and I'll just give you an example that LA County, which is two hours away, is the hardest city, the hardest county, uh, in, the, in the hardest nation to count. So not only uh, does uh, California have a challenge because of Los Angeles, but we have also challenges in California because of uh, farm workers and immigrants and maybe low broadband coverage in various parts of the states. So we have a very uh, tough challenge if it's going to be online. Not everybody has a broadband coverage. And because of our current uh, uh, climate, political climate, there is more fear for immigrants and other people of color and other disenfranchised organizations and uh, people who are very concerned about not only filling out the questionnaire uh, at all, but of course only f filling out if there will be a citizenship question. So we want to engage our jurisdictions and our, our counties and our ACBOs and our community-based organizations to really help us out, make sure that we have a complete count. As uh, Joe Allen said, the reason we're doing the census is because we need to make sure we don't lose any congressional seats and because we get money back into our locations and our cities and our counties. So uh, this is the role the U.S. Census will be actually doing, conducting the, the actual census. The state of California, I'll give you a quick history. I was part of the 2000 census. It was the very first time there was a California Complete Count Committee. It was because of the 1990 undercount. It was so severe that, that the state legislature decided to, to put together a complete count committee. There was about $24 million. I was, about, I was a graduate student at USC at that time, and I worked in the Sacramento office. In 2010, they formed another complete count committee, but because of the recession, they only had $4 million to work with. Now in 2020, uh, uh, thankfully because we have uh, such a diverse population and our governor and our legislature know how important the census is, they have apportioned up to $154 million for the state. So we have an unprecedented amount of funding for California and it is our job to make sure that everyone is counted. So we are very happy to be here. The local government, uh, we are asking Every county, there's, there are 58 counties in the state of California. I'll give you, show you a map how we've uh, drawn up the 10 regions. And in each region, anybody can form a local complete count committee, but we really are going to be working with the counties to do the local complete, com complete count committee. So if, there's, if the Sikhs in, Calif in Santa Barbara or the Campesinos, the Papurepecha groups of indigenous people want to form a complete count committee, they can, but we also ask them to form, uh, be part of the subcommittees of the uh, official local complete count committee. We are, have established some contracts with our counties. We have established contracts with the administrative uh, community-based organizations. I'm going to announce who are our awardees for the state. We are also working with tribal governments and, uh, and the media, which, which will be coming out next. next uh, actually, the RFP has been released. So this is the, the different groups of people we're working with, local complete count committees, faith-based organizations, schools, statewide, media, and we'll be conducting some implementation plan workshops later in the summer, June through September, and I'll quickly go into that. Quickly, these are the hard to reach, uh, hard to count people. We have about 15 uh, groups of people, and I will give the slides to everybody else because uh, I'm going really quick. If you are going, if you are a GIS person, you want to see where the hard to count people are in your city, in your county, go onto our California website, and you'll be able to go by tract of what, who, who, uh, what areas are 
are undercounted. So skip that, I will skip that. We are educating, motivating, activating because we want to deploy everybody but January of 2020. And these are the people we're collaborating with across all sectors. This is where we find our hard to count. And this is our map of the 10 regions. Uh, you are in region five, Santa Barbara, you're in a, uh, the central coast. And these are original, original ACB awards. So for uh, five, Ventura County Community Foundation is our, your awardee. And we will be uh, announcing the statewide community-based organizations uh, Friday. Please visit our website, contact, contact uh, get on to our mailing list. You'll find out all webinars that we have going on. We've had several that you can go onto our website and we will be having more. And this is our social media contact as well. And I just want to say one thing about Santa Barbara. So based on the latest Census American Community Estimate, Santa Barbara County has almost 200,000 people living in census tracts with a California Hard to Count Index above statewide median. And what are the leading reasons for, this, for the Hard to Count in Santa Barbara County, you may be asking? Well, almost one half of the Hard to Count live in census tracts where the percentage of renter-occupied units is among the top hard to count reasons. A little more than 40% of the hard to count live in census tracts where the percentage of crowded units and uh, roughly the same percentage, so about 40% live in census tracts where the percentage of adults 25 or over have not graduated from high school. So these are the top hard to count reasons. And other leading causes of being hard to count in Santa Barbara County is per, uh, percent of children under five and percentage of non-family households. So people living one, more than one family or multiple people living in one household. So that kind of gives you a picture of your hard to count communities here in Santa Barbara and go gauchos. <laughs> I did that really, really quick. <laughs> My great. apologies. You were great. Thank you very, very much. That was uh, really a, a fast tour. Uh, and we will show you some maps uh, a little bit later in the presentation to show you the specific tracks um, that are of greatest concern for us um, here in, in Santa Barbara County, especially on the South Coast. So, so what I'd like to do now is to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have a, a great array. I'm also asking you to, um, as was mentioned before, to consider any questions you might have, to write those down on the index cards, and we'll provide some time during the forum to answer your specific questions. First off, and I'm just gonna read through all of their bios and then we'll get to their presentations. I think it'll be more efficient that way. So first up, Vanessa Bechtel is uh, right here. Uh, she is the president and CEO of the Ventura County Community Foundation. And she's been, um, prior to her arrival there in February of 2015, uh, Vanessa served as the executive director at the Santa Barbara City College Foundation, where she more than doubled their annual fundraising. As a founder of a wealth management company, uh, she has been named Businesswoman of the Year by Santa Barbara Chamber of Commerce, and for the last two years has made the list of top women in business uh, by the Pacific Coast Business Times. Uh, as an active uh, volunteer herself, uh, Bechtel all has served as a board member for the Santa Barbara Family YMCA, an ambassador uh, for, uh, to the uh, Santa Barbara Chamber of Commerce, was a trustee at the Santa Barbara County Retirement Board and treasurer of the State Association of County Retirement Systems. And she's the past president of the Institute of Management Accountants uh, and Santa Barbara Road. Uh, Sonoma County native, uh, and she graduated from the University of California at Santa Barbara in 2001, go Gauchos. In August 2016, uh, she received her Master of Business Administration from the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California, and she also has a master's certificate from the International Institute for the Sociology of Law from Antony, Spain. Next up, Brian Breslin is with us here. He's a senior transportation planner at the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments. For over 30 years, he's been employed with federal and regional planning agencies, most recently as the senior planner for the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments. He has a BA in environmental analysis from UC Irvine, and eaters, and a master in city and regional planning uh, from California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo. I don't remember what their mascot is. 
Mustangs. Okay. <laughs> Next uh, with us is Patricia Keelan, who is the CEO for the Community Action Commission of Santa Barbara County. She joined uh, the CAC of Santa Barbara County as CEO in November of 2017. She has nearly 30 years of experience working in nonprofit management and services and has spent the last nine years engaged in the National Community Action Network of services focused on alleviating the causes and the conditions of poverty. Under Pat's leadership, the CAC is implementing performance-based management practices to enhance the organization's capacity to track long-term programmatic outcomes related to poverty and self-sufficiency. In addition, CAC is expanding to mission-driven services, including a new financial literacy program, a family self-sufficiency program, and earned income tax credit education and outreach program. Pat has a master's degree in counseling from Clemson University and a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of South Florida, and has served on the board of directors for career sources of uh, Paso Hernando and career sources Citrus uh, Marian Levy in Central Florida. I probably just butchered that, sorry. Uh, next is Steve Ortiz. Uh, Steve is the president and CEO of the United Way of Santa Barbara County. He is in the last 13 years uh, as the executive director there. Uh, during uh, Ortiz's, during Steve's uh, tenure, he has been instrumental in transforming United Way into a community impact organization that identifies social issues, convenes experts and partners with the organizations across multiple sectors. He and his team have raised close to $50 million to create, expand, and deliver results-driven, innovative, strategic partnerships for the benefit of the local community. Steve has been lead marketing and public relations, has led, pardon me, marketing and public relations campaign and program and partnership training. Steve holds a bachelor's degree from the University of California at Santa Barbara and a master's in business administration from Cal Lutheran. Ortiz and his wife Amber have two children, Isabella Rose, so she can hear her name on TV, she's five, and Ethan James, who's two, so Ethan, your dad's here. <laughs> Next up is uh, Stephanie Ramirez Zarate. She's the field rep for uh, Assembly Member Monique Lamone. She's been working with her office, and, working with Assembly Member Lamone uh, since uh, she took office in 2016. Her duties in Assembly District 37 include oversight on issues ranging from K-12 and higher education, agricultural and labor issues, immigration, and other civil rights related concerns and issues. Stephanie enjoys supporting local efforts and fostering relationships with local partners, including supporting the work of our nonprofits and community-based organizations. Stephanie completed her bachelor's degree in political science in public policy from UCLA, but is a proud transfer student from Santa Barbara City College. Stephanie has been a lead representative in the district following the 2020 census work, and she works, looks forward to assisting Santa Barbara and Ventura counties in preparation for a successful count. And last but not least is Diane Martinez. She is the director of Immigrant Hope Santa Barbara, uh, a nonprofit Immigration Legal Center. In 2005, Diane and her husband Craig moved to the west side of Santa Barbara while working with immigrant families at Santa Barbara City College at church and living among immigrant families, she felt God's call to love her neighbor in a more tangible way and open the Immigrant Hope of Santa Barbara in 2012. Immigrant Hope helps immigrants determine if there is a pathway to residency and provides educational opportunities. Since 1988, Diane has worked with disadvantaged and underserved populations. So that's our panel. I ask you to give them a warm welcome. So I'm just going to do a brief intro, and then I want to turn it over to Vanessa. So I don't want to recap this too much, but as you know, the census is uh, done every 10 years and required by law, as Joe shared with us. The account is going to occur beginning on April 1st, 2020, less than just about a year away. We've talked a little bit about the new technology challenges as well as the challenge of the citizenship question. And as we begin to do our, prepare our efforts for a complete count in Santa Barbara County, we will 
continue to be focused on these issues because they're going to be challenges regardless. Given the current climate, given the current uh, disparity in incomes for many people that can't access uh, broadband uh, computer systems, then we need to continue to do that. Really, the key aspect of this is that the census is going to determine the access to many federal funds. We've talked about billions of dollars. We've talked about trillions of dollars in potential lost revenue in the state of California. Let's make it real concrete. What this gets down to is approximately $2,000 per person per year for the next 10 years for every single individual that we undercount in Santa Barbara County in the state of California. That's the stakes. $2,000 per person per year for the next 10 years. We came very close to losing representation at the 2010 election, or 2010 census. The risk of losing representation from the state of California is significant, as was mentioned before. And this um, really importantly, uh, and the last time I was actually with you was in 2011 talking about the redistricting of the county. Uh, and so, importantly, many cities in the last several years have been going to district-based elections, and this will be this first census data that they will be utilizing to make sure that the, cent that the uh, population is equal in every single city council district, where council districts now exist, as well as with the county, as well as with assembly, senate, and congressional seats. So up to this point, here's what the county's efforts have been. We've established a steering committee uh, to create a local uh, complete count strategic plan. That work began in January. We did opt in to the state complete count funding. It was a choice the county made. The Board of Supervisors adopted that. And so we have now completed the contract documents to receive $354,000 from that state pot of money. Uh, that was mentioned previously. And we're also looking to work through the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments uh, through their regional committee structure because that provides a unique opportunity to work with uh, local elected officials in each of our cities in collaboration with the county. And so we would like to use that local regional committee structure that already exists so that both the unincorporated area of the county as well as the incorporated cities have access and understanding about the resources available for the complete count efforts. And we'd like them to help us with monitoring our implementation plan. So this is a uh, kind of a uh, diagram between now, actually this last month, and 2020. And I want to just point out that in the next two months, uh, in the green areas above, we're going to have to be submitting a strategic plan to the state of California for what it is that we are going to do with that $354,000, right? And then, for some reason, they want us to be accountable, so we have to do <laughs> quarterly reports and, and things like that throughout that process. Um, and then later on this summer, as was mentioned, uh, we will be responsible for developing an implementation plan which really deals with the methods and tactics for how we're gonna do the outreach for our particular hard to count communities. Uh, and so that's, that's really our timeline. Uh, we saw some big California maps. Here's a Santa Barbara County map. The areas highlighted in red are the census tracts with a higher than normal uh, census, uh, a hard to count census factor. And so you see downtown Santa Maria, you see uh, downtown Lompoc and the outskirts of, of Lompoc on the northwest side of Lompoc. And then in the red box toward the bottom, two areas of major concern here in the south coast. Isla Vista with a rather transient student population who probably think mom and dad are counting them. And secondly, on the lower west side, and which is one of the reasons why we have Diana here to, to really talk about what's happening there. So with that, I'd like to now uh, turn it over to uh, Vanessa. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dennis. And I am just delighted to be here with you. Um, I have a little timer, so I'll just kind of monitor that. I know uh, we have a limited time. So 
I thought about what is the most important message I could bring today to you. And I think that the most important message is a combination of what inspired me to really get involved with the, the census, what has moved me about the census, and what has propelled our county forward in Ventura County. And to share with you as someone who's lived in Santa Barbara for 22 years, recognizing that Santa Barbara and Ventura County have been named 58th and 59th in the nation as the hardest to count counties, which is the top 2% of counties in our country. Um, and so we really do um, have some serious um, dollars at stake and some serious consequences that we could face if we don't all work uh, together. Sometimes, um, I don't know where my slide went. Um, those aren't mine. Um, all right, I will um, ignore my, my slides and uh, just speak from uh, the heart. The funds from the census go to things like rural and industry development loans, child care for infants, resources for our seniors, our policing agencies, waste and water disposal systems. The list of funding and the ways that the census impacts our life on a daily basis and impacts the entire health of our social safety net system cannot be stated the more intensely. I mean, it is just the most profound sources of funding that we have for our community. And in 2017, Emmett Carson from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation approached me and said, Vanessa, we're particularly concerned about your neighborhoods, Ventura County, Santa Barbara County. And he's right, there we're right to be concerned. So I had some slides that talk about the funding, and the state has put aside some pretty significant resources, 90 million, and then an approved additional 50 million. How that breaks down um, in the county, Dennis just touched on for Santa Barbara, but the Region 5 was grouped together for the funding that went to community-based organizations. That was 1.1 million. And it gives us an opportunity throughout the region, and our region includes San Benito County, Monterey County, Santa Cruz County, San Luis Obispo County, Santa Barbara, and Ventura County. We're grouped together as a region because we have some binding similarities. We also have some differences, but it gives us a profound opportunity to actually connect together and pool our resources for the maximum impact. When we did the analysis in Ventura County as an example, what we learned was that it was going to take at least 5.8 million to do adequate, hard to count outreach. Now our county only received 288,000 for the state and our funding out of that 1.1 million breaks down to about 347,000. That leaves a significant gap and this is where we can really come together. And I love the fact that this is being hosted by the League of Women Voters. Frankly, we love the League of Women Voters. And our local chapter is actually helping us go around and make presentations so that we can unite the entire county and our entire region. We currently in San Ventura County have 100 and now 50 community-based organizations, faith-based organizations and individuals that have formed the complete count. Um, we invite some regional subcommittee focus, including a philanthropic subcommittee, because if we go together to seek additional funding support from state resources, we can accomplish so much more. We can partner together, and this is the real key message. Not only do we need to make the census lovable, relatable, and something that's on everybody's mind, but we need to maximize the impact and the reach of every dollar because it's very unlikely that we're gonna raise 5.8 million in Ventura County. And I don't know how um, ambitious you are, but um, you would have to do something somewhat similar here. So if we bond together, we can leverage technology, media, we can partner together for grant requests, we can partner together for outreach and education. A lot of our organizations work regionally and have partners um, of similar nature. We can help um, combine training. Our community college district in Ventura County, for example, has volunteered to do certificate courses for all of our uh, volunteers. And that's all the time I have. But I just hope we leave with um, 
the fact that you can always reach out to us. Um, I, I, I'll leave Dennis my card, and um, I'm really looking forward to making this the most successful census ever. All right. Yeah, I'm going to speak about something a little different, but I think um, it provides kind of a background and perspective on how much work goes into the census and uh, how important the data that it uh, provides is. And so I'm going to talk about understanding census data and some of its uses. Uh, first of all, SBCAG, Santa Barbara County Association of Governments, in addition to regional transportation planning, is uh, referred to also as a census affiliate center which means we're part of a state network of organizations that help analyze and disseminate census data and also help in preparation for the uh, decennial census. And that is um, organized by the State Department of Finance and their demographic research unit. And um, they also um, analyze and, and uh, census data. And uh, for budgetary purposes, they do annual estimates of the population that uses the census as a, as a baseline, basically using a housing unit method where they update the population for all the cities in the unincorporated area. And um, <clears throat> also, um, they do a long range forecast, 40-year uh, population forecast, also for budgetary purposes, using census data as a starting point by um, age and race and using birth and mortality rates, they're able to age the population and um, they also try to estimate uh, net migration. So those are some of the uses of census data by the Department of Finance. Um, you're probably aware there's a census website, census.gov. That's where you'll find um, background on uh, the census, the, you'll find data, you'll find there's a Census Bureau does a lot of other surveys as well. So if you have any questions, detailed questions, that's a great place to start. And um, you know, that's where you can download the data. And that's where the census maps are, uh, definitions, and information about the 220 census. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about census geography because that's the basis of um, how the data is put together. Uh, just real briefly, uh, it's a hierarchy in the census geography, starting with census blocks, which are essentially city blocks and urban areas. And then block groups, which are aggregation of blocks. Um, there's about 300 in Santa Barbara County. And then we have census tracts, there's about 70 census tracts in, in Santa Barbara County. It was referenced in some of those hard to count maps. And then there's something called census designated places, which are the cities and unincorporated named places like Orcutt or Montecito. They're not, un, they're not incorporated, but they're named places. And then all this is put on a, a, a nationwide digital map uh, called the Tiger Line Files. Um, the Census Bureau has a lot of abbreviations for things that, that stands for um, Typologically integrated geographic encoding and reference files. So uh, we'll just leave it at that. Um, and uh, so basically, a, a digital map of the country with all its geography, and then they, they place each housing unit in that geography so it's um, you know, geo referenced, and um, that's where we know where, where people are. And, um, and then there's the, the 2020 census, um, but there's also the American Community Survey, which is an ongoing annual survey. Um, sample, and that has a lot of the detailed uh, census data uh, related to income, uh, you know, poverty, um, household types, um, employment, education, things like that. Uh, the census, which happens every 10 years, is just basically, you know, the count of people, the um, age, uh, and the race, and the gender. So it's pretty limited. Um, and the American Community Survey has been around about 10 years. Prior to that, uh, every 10 years there was the, the, the uh, um, called the short form, which is just the, goes to every household, so it's not a sample. But then they did the long form, which was a sample, one in every seven households. And so that was what we had for 10 years. But now the American Community Survey provides us, it's a rolling sample, so every year we get updates of the census data, the detailed data. Uh, but again, it's just every 10 years that the total population is counted. And then, um, you know, there's a lot of things that go into the census uh, that you don't know about. Um, some things we're involved with, uh, for example, something called the BBSP. Uh, I told you there's a lot of abbreviations. That's the Block Boundary uh, Suggestion Program. So you, you can adjust your census blocks and add new road uh, networks 
to the Tiger Line files so you can update the census map so it accounts for new, new roads. Uh, then the LUCA program is a local updated census addresses. So the Census Bureau wants to make sure that they have a list of all the census, uh, all the uh, housing units, because that's where they send the, uh, either the survey form to, or you know, they're gonna send a little card saying, hey, what respond to the census through the internet. Oh, was there? Um, so that, uh, that's really important to update the census address. And then the PSAP is the uh, Participant Statistical Areas Program where you update uh, census tracts to try to um, adjust them to their optimum population size and then add new census places, which we're trying to do for the Eastern Goleta Valley, um, which wasn't a census place um, prior. And uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, applications. Um, the Census Transportation Planning Package is basically uh, journey to work data, so it tells us where people live and where they work, or their commute times, their mode of travel, et cetera. <clears throat> and a report uh, that was done by SBK age, age characteristics, uh, referencing the baby boomers and how that affects the population um, in the future. And um, for example, in the South Coast, about 1,400 persons retire um, over age 50 and, uh, you know, has effects on, you know, they might want to age in place, you know, the next worker, where are they going to live, are they going to commute, for example. Uh, employment uh, information, jobs by economic sector, um, you know, South Coast has higher paying jobs versus North County, mostly agricultural jobs. Uh, then there's a surplus of jobs in the South Coast, about 20,000 relative to the um, resident workers. North County, 11,000 job deficit, that's why there's, you know, fewer jobs in North County, they commute to the South Coast. And as mentioned before, there's other applications for sense data grants, um, funding allocations based on population, and then uh, again, adjusting the supervisor districts and the local uh, voting districts as well. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, well good afternoon. Um, my name is Pat Keelan. I know we've talked a little bit about uh, how important it is for us to work together to ensure that we have a complete accurate count and we, now we've talked a little bit about the data collection. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit today about the hard to count population and who that comprises. Um, but I'm going to start back with the map that Dennis previously covered and I just want to reemphasize the fact that there are some key hotspots areas where we need to focus in order to um, do outreach and education around the 2020 census and the importance of completing the census um, as we move forward. So if we look at the map of Santa Barbara County, as Dennis indicated, the downtown areas of Santa Maria and Lompoc are key areas that we would like to work to ensure that we receive a complete accurate count as well as areas of, um, of uh, Santa Barbara uh, South County, including um, the waterfront and Isla Vista. Um, approximately uh, 21,500 individuals in uh, the Santa Barbara County region are estimated to be hard to count populations. If you put that into numbers, that equates, um, if we uh, calculate at a $2,000 per person per year, uh, amount, that's a loss of revenue for the Santa Barbara County of approximately $43 million annually in funding that could be used to support uh, the residents of Santa Barbara County in many, many ways. So it's important that we know who the hard to count population includes and that as we move forward, we uh, reach out to them and uh, really uh, educate them about the importance of completing the census here in Santa Barbara County. So who are the hard to count? Um, the Public Policy Institute of California have uh, defined that for us. Uh, it includes some racial and ethnic groups, including African Americans, Latinos, and indigenous groups, uh, and young children. Uh, they're historically undercounted. Non-citizens are obviously less likely to complete the census has been, that's been discussed um, previously. Uh, renters, uh, those who are occupying, uh, occupying overcrowded and hard to uh, find um, housing, including garages and trailers and things of that nature, are very difficult to locate and, uh, and uh, engage in the census process. Uh, and um, equally important as we move forward, those areas that have uh, limited access uh, or 
uh, and inadequate access to the internet are going to be particularly hard to count as we move forward uh, this next year. Other vets and other groups um, that are difficult to count also include veterans, people with disabilities, seniors, the homeless, and as was mentioned earlier, college students. So what are um, some of our outreach strategies? Well, our steering committee has already met in Santa Barbara County to do some preliminary planning around how best to conduct outreach and educate the hard to count populations around the census. We plan to maximize our use of technology. Um, obviously, the use of the internet, social media is important. Um, using um, applications such as Dial My Call <coughs> campaigns to push out text messages to the hard to count um, populations is another way that we can utilize technology. We can utilize existing networks within the county, including social services, our schools, our libraries, the colleges and universities, civic groups, faith-based groups, our first responders, uh, and local business community are other ways that we can um, uh, utilize the, the uh, resources here in, in uh, Santa Barbara County to do outreach. Uh, the 211 Santa Barbara helpline is also another important uh, means of getting information out about the census uh, and being available, our call representatives to be available to answer questions and concerns around the census um, is uh, going to be important moving forward and we have the capacity there to do that. Uh, 211 also has two-way texting uh, capability where people can text and uh, get information about the census. Uh, we have a web resource page on 211 as well. Utilizing groups such as the Primatoris Network is going to be important um, in reaching out to the Hispanic uh, and Mexteco communities. And also, uh, just thinking about branding and marketing uh, is going to be very important as we move forward. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be focusing on how we're going to be implementing um, some of that outreach uh, through the United Way network and other community-based organizations. Um, our goal, number one, is to make sure that the individuals involved in the process uh, find trust, especially if there are questions that they are um, concerned about. And through our network, uh, being a longstanding organization in Santa Barbara County, and in the region, we will be able to connect with many of the individuals and families, households where we've developed that trust. Um, our initial thought as far as engagement was very clear when we saw that list of um, individuals hardest to count that Pat described. Um, many of those individuals listed are exactly the people we serve on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so from the Latino population, uh, kids zero to five, um, those who are homeless, individuals and families, um, seniors, we have programs that are specific to helping those individuals in a variety of ways. Uh, so our goal is to use that network um, with that trust and make sure that they are counted through the process and then extend that to our partnership as well. You know, as a United Way, we partner with about 200 plus organizations every year and we wanna make sure that they have the information they need to uh, support us through this process along with the County of Santa Barbara. Um, additionally, we are able to connect very closely with the schools. Uh, we have a lot of school-based programming uh, through United Way, both in the summertime, during school days, and uh, that way we could access a lot of the families uh, who may be hard to count as well, and also just inform individuals who would like more information about the count. Um, and United Way historically has been very closely tied uh, to the workplace and corporate setting. Uh, we interact every single year with 200 plus organizations, workplaces, uh, through annual campaigns or uh, advocacy and volunteerism activities. Um, and that will be one way that we will also engage through the corporate side, both at a leadership level and with employees throughout uh, the county. Um, and one piece that we see with the change to being more of a digital format, um, we do have many partners, including ourselves in our office, where we're able to um, go out with laptops, iPads, and develop kiosks in different areas where people may have access in a comfortable space, uh, in a trusted space where they could come and fulfill uh, that information, and they could also receive support through that process so they don't feel like they have no clue what they're doing at home. 
Uh, so our goal again is to make it as easy, accessible as possible through our networks um, in the schools, in the community-based organizations, in the workplace, uh, to make sure that more uh, of the individuals are counted here in Santa Barbara County because uh, those that we serve on a daily basis through the United Way network are exactly the people who will be using federal dollars in the future. And we wanna make sure that those funds are available. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Stephanie. I am a field representative for uh, one of our state representatives, Assemblymember Monique Limon. And uh, my piece for this presentation is mostly going to deal with, with representation and why the 2020 census matters to not only federal representation, but also at the state level. So uh, on the screen here, we have a map of our district, Assembly District 37. Uh, we, we share this district with uh, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, who I also see a uh, representative here in the audience. Uh, our district is about 90 miles long. It starts from the outer parts of Buellton, uh, right where Lompoc uh, cuts off, all the way to Oxnard. So um, we are very much part of that region five that um, that comes to relates to funding with Ventura and Santa Barbara counties, and uh, our representation is approximately half a million uh, constituents in the district. So why does it matter? We I think it was mentioned that w an undercount could result in in losing a congressional seat. And that is not something we want. At the state level, um, there is not so much the risk of losing a seat. However, we do risk having, uh, we're risking equitable representation as uh, our district, which right now is about half a million people in areas, um, I'll show you a map, and I think it's the following map. In, in California, when we're looking at the hard to count areas, we see that uh, Southern California in that red, that red uh, area and, and Northern California, all of that red, that could mean people that are not counted for yet in a state district that uh, might mean uh, hundreds of, of people more unaccounted for. So it's an issue of representation which will ultimately translate, translate into resources as well. Um, so what is the state, the, the role of the state as a whole? Um, the very obvious one is funding. Um, I believe the, the, uh, a representative from the complete count mentioned that this state is really putting a lot of effort on, uh, with funding. A hundred thousand, a hundred million has already been approved and 54 million is, has been proposed for the 2019 budget with our new governor, and so it is very likely that we will be counting with 154 million to go towards outreach efforts. And um, as a state office, our role is really to understand how that information is being disseminated to our community-based organizations and really making those connections between both counties. And, and again, that connection of the heart to count and being able to, to be a good messenger uh, throughout the community. And um, at the end, again, representation matters. The reason why uh, our main job here in, in the district is understanding how state legislation is impacting our districts in Santa Barbara and in Ventura County. And um, these are some of the, the services that, that is available to our community. Anything from uh, constituent services, if you're ever having an issue with a state agency, for example, the DMV, it's a very common agency that, that we get calls about. Um, that's one of the services that our office can help you with. Uh, constituent services, anything relating to the state as far as legislation, you can call our office and find out about pending legislation or legislation that has been signed or going up for a vote. And that way also voice your opinion on certain bills. And um, most importantly, again, expressing your opinion on what kind of uh, laws you want passed in, in the state of California. 
So I wanted to leave you with, with uh, our contact information. We're just down the street. The Santa Barbara District Office is on Anapamu and Chapala. And there is my boss up there. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, as uh, Dennis had mentioned, uh, I work in the west side of Santa Barbara, which is one of the uh, hard-to-count areas. And so what we did is we actually invited a few months ago uh, some of our uh, west side immigrant neighbors in and did a little survey with them. Uh, prior to telling them anything about uh, the, the census itself, we took a survey and asked how many would actually be willing to part participate. And now um, they had different uh, statuses. Some of them were citizens, some of them were legal permanent residents, and some of them had no status. Um, and so just so you see, um, we, t we asked uh, a couple of questions. If the citizenship uh, question was included, who would participate um, in the census? And uh, you can see it would be a very low uh, participation rate uh, for that with um, 17 uh, people, 61% saying they would not participate in it and five undecided, so only 21%. Um, agreeing to participate at that point. If the citizen question was not included, um, there was uh, a, uh, a higher percentage that, would, that said that they would participate, which is 46%, um, and then 54% were still um, either no or undecided. Um, so if we'll go to the next thing. The other thing we wanted to do is a lot of times uh, we think we know uh, what the reasons are for people um, to participate or not participate. And so we actually uh, pulled this group together and asked them to help us understand what the challenges are um, in the neighborhoods. Um, and um, the number one thing that they said was trust. Um, and so, um, of course, um, the information is confidential um, and has only been used for statistical purposes. Um, but however, there is such a wide mistrust of our current national administration um, that um, most of them said that they don't trust that the information would not be utilized somehow um, against them. Um, uh, again, in the re uh, west side, when, when we were talking about some of the hard to count areas, um, uh, many of the things that they mentioned were, uh, are an issue there. There is a, a very dense population of people. We have a lot of apartment housings there with, with uh, subletting rooms, and so we have multiple house uh, people living together. Um, and so many of them were uh, not comfortable um, trying to do a census and have, uh, have to count the people that are in the rooms with them. Um, so uh, that also goes along with the mixed households holding different immigration statuses. Um, so uh, especially if the citizen question is asked, they wouldn't want to be able to, or they wouldn't want to have to report uh, the status of many of the people living in their households. Um, we also have um, many people moving around um, a lot um, in, uh, within the west side or just e even into other areas. Um, and then, uh, of course, the digital census and access to computers was going to be uh, an issue. We also have quite a few uh, elderly immigrants living in the neighborhoods, and so uh, being able to do, uh, uh, to respond to the census um, through com a computer would be an issue. Um, and then, um, as we started talking to uh, even this group about uh, the census, um, and many of them were really not aware of how the census works and how it's used for funding and services. Um, and so it's really going to be an educational uh, opportunity for us to help them understand that many of the services that their children use are, are tied uh, to the funding and being able to, um, uh, that's why it's important to be able to have an accurate count for the, for the census. So, thank you. everybody for participating and providing that input. So I've got a couple of questions uh, just to kind of get us warmed up and then I've just gotten your stack of questions and this will buy me like two seconds to organize them, all right? So the first, uh, first question, and this is, we'll just throw it out to the panelists, whoever would like to jump in. Uh, we've talked a lot about the challenges and they are many. Uh, what are the opportunities that Census 2020 brings? 
Well, we're, our, we're the glass half full people here. Uh, well, I will see. I will share just what we're already seeing. At our last complete count committee in Ventura County, we had 35 more attendees than we had anticipated. We had three languages going on at the table simultaneously. And at the end of the meeting, Dr. Gabino Aguirre stood up and said, you know, in any community, you have those that operate in the sunlight, in the big picture, and you have those that operate at the top of the blades of grass. But our community is formed from the roots up. And that is something that I have seen in this 2020 Complete Count effort. Our Complete Count Committee has been meeting for nine months. I know Complete Count Committees are in different stages. But I will tell you, I think this is a rocking chair moment. I think this is something that I'm going to look back on 40 years from now. And I'm going to think this was one of the most rewarding ways I could be of service to the community. And I know so many of you. I know you. I've known you for a really long time. And I will tell you, you work really hard to make our community a better place. There is no opportunity to make such a profound difference financially for our social safety net as the 2020 census in our lifetime. It just doesn't exist. So if you're not engaged, get engaged. And if you want to know how to help, I don't have time to go through all of the different ways, but there are so many ways that we can each make a difference. And I think that that's really what's beautiful. And I think that the networks and the community that we're putting together now are going to go way beyond the 2020 census effort. Great. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? That was, that was good. Diane? You know, I, I think that, or in my hand, okay. Um, I think that uh, we have a great opportunity, not just within the immigrant community, but there were a multiple list of the hard to count uh, people that are out there um, of building relationships and using uh, community-based organizations and faith-based organizations to build relationships and better understand um, not only um, uh, Help not only to help them understand the importance of it, but better understand them. And um, and just relationship building is just, I think, a great opportunity that the census is going to provide. That's great. Pat. Yeah, I just want to add that <clears throat> as a community action agency, we're working at the community level all the time. And we are constantly encountering uh, situations where it's very difficult to engage with those who and gain the trust of those who need us most. And by, um, by being able to work and educate them and start to build a trust and a rapport with these hard to count populations, it's going to enable us to better serve the community on a long-term basis. We are going to be engaged in capacity building here at every level of the community. And so I can't, I, I um, echo what you said earlier, Vanessa, that this is probably a pivotal point for our community in bringing all of the different facets of the community together to work towards making our community a better place with the resources that we need to make this community a better place to live. That's really great. Thank you. And, you know, it just seems to me what we've been through in the last, you know, 15 months here between the Thomas Fire and then the debris flow in Montecito has really brought our community together in a really significant way. And this is actually, I think, in a lot of ways, a real way to demonstrate that community aspect that we've really grown. We've, we've had to exercise all of our communication muscles in order to make people safe, in order to help people be informed. And so now is this kind of moment where we get to directly apply that to something significant uh, for, for the community in, in this venue through the census. So um, here, here's one of the questions uh, from the audience that uh, I thought was really interested, and I might ask my friends uh, from the Complete Count Committee to understand better how this works, so unless somebody up here knows. And two people asked this question, and I've had this question. If the census, uh, if the census question on citizen, citizenship remains in place, will it just be possible to skip that question? And what happens to the rest of your survey, right? I mean, so I kind of wondered, do, do you, I mean, does anybody, has anybody heard info on this? Do you guys know? I hate to put you on this spot. Well, it, it's actually um, illegal to encourage anyone to not complete the census. Okay, we won't encourage anybody. Um, and you are not supposed to skip 
a census question, that also is not consistent with um, the law. I can add to that. Um, <laughs> if it's a survey or a web-based survey, if you don't respond, it'll kick the survey back. It won't, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't, I don't actually think the census is going to work like that um, for the 2020 census. Um, what I've been told by our, our national office is that it won't skip. Okay, so on, on kind of a related note, I, there was another audience question here that I thought was really good too, um, and, and maybe Brian or somebody else. Does ICE have any access to individual census data? That's a definite negative. Uh, the Census Bureau is really concerned with um, confidentiality, so uh, individual records are not released until after 70 years for genealogists to use, but um, as far as, um, ice goes, that's, that's not going to happen. Okay. So let's, uh, let's, so here's one. I, I'm curious, how does the new digital process actually work? Will individuals be notified by mail to go online? Will people just be urged by the media to go online? How does, how does that work? Do any panelists got to read on that? Okay. So starting in March of 2020, households will receive something via mail, snail mail, that will tell you what your login information is. And I might have that in my, in my PowerPoint. I can give you actual dates. There, you'll get five opportunities. If not, someone, uh, and one of those five opportunities, someone will leave a questionnaire in your mailbox. And if you don't respond, uh, then someone may come and um, knock on your door. And, and I know no knocking on your door is a very scary thing for many immigrants. And so uh, one of the things that I didn't mention is that we have a sword system, which is um, online mapping that will collaborate with the US Census Bureau to get real time information. If certain, certain tracks are not responding, then we'll do a, a quick shift on our end and we'll request our ACBOs and counties and partners in that area to do a shift in, a, in, in whatever areas are undercounted. And so we'll have real-time information of certain areas that have not been responding. So I mentioned earlier we have the strategic plan, we have this implementation plan. Um, one of the other requirements of the state a little bit further down the line uh, next fall will be to come up with this follow-up plan which will use this data more or less real time to be able to put people into the field or to target our marketing message to get people's participation more or less on a real time basis. And so that will be a real um, uh, operational advantage as we really do roll out the um, outreach efforts um, to unique populations, especially where we see that their participation rate is, is lower than we would want. And since our goal is 100% participation, not 99.9, .9. our goal is 100% participation. You know, we'll, we'll be monitoring that closely. Let me, here's one of my questions too, let me turn back and to the panel here. Um, from your perspective, what new outreach methods are we gonna need to think about this time that we did not have to think about 10 years ago? Well, I, I think one of the hard to count populations that we're not talking about today is our senior population. You know, the census is moving online um, for the first time. It isn't something that was widely tested. It was barely tested at all. You know, I, we did a massive forum in Ventura County and what was striking to me was the fear that traditionally non-hard-to-count non populations were having in the same things that have been coming up with the hard-to-count traditional population. The climate of fear, cybersecurity, broadband and internet access. 40% of our, uh, there are tracks in Oxnard where 40% of the population does not have adequate broadband or internet access to even complete the census online. So it's not even an option. So here's where the creative ideas come from. Number one, we have to make the census lovable. Um, one of the strategies we had was actually engaging Count Von Count, 
with uh, Sesame Street. Do you know the count? Um, he's in 150 different countries in numerous different languages. And Sesame Street has agreed to let us borrow the count for our complete count committee effort. So we can get coloring books and you know, send them home in our schools in multiple languages, little books, postcards. We can capitalize, you know, we talked to our um, a county treasure, uh, treasurer, and she said that we can put information about the census in our mailings. We've got to look for every single type of activity that we do, the fairs, our grocery stores, our churches. This is where we just need to blast the community with the census, but it can't, it cannot be so dry. We've got to pump it up a bit because what's really going to motivate people at the end of the day, especially given the outreach that we're going to need to do, is that feeling in the heart. Okay, so that's where we're going to have some fun, but we need to not ignore um, one of our hardest to count populations now in this 2020 census is those that are not, may, may not be as comfortable with the internet. Other um, things that we need to do differently this time around that we didn't even have to consider last time. Well, I would just add a couple of things. I think that the use of social media, we have you know, tremendous opportunities through Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all of those, you know, um, kind of hip things to do uh, in terms of reaching out to the community. Um, and I think there are some other uh, technologies that we can utilize. For instance, with our Santa Barbara 211 helpline, we've been um, utilizing the helpline for outreach purposes for the of the earned income tax credit um, education to let people know that this tax credit is available. And we're using um, texting, two-way texting, for instance, um, where we can re um, reach out to a potential client or um, a, a resident can actually reach out to us and have a live operator answering their question in real time so they don't even have to make a call. A lot of people are very comfortable with their, their smartphone, so that's a way that we can utilize the technology and, and help to educate and um, remove some of the fear of asking questions about the census. The other thing is that we're also utilizing the, the um, Dial My Call uh, campaign um, application where we're a actually able to um, access telephone numbers and text information out about the earned income tax credit. Uh, and so uh, it provides basic information on the earned income tax credit, where to, um, to go to uh, uh, get involved or apply for through the VITA program, uh, and um, also to, um, to learn more about how, where they can call to get information through 211 and other resources. So there's a lot of new things that we can utilize in terms of the technology to, um, to maximize our efforts. And Pat, is, I'm not sure, um, not everyone in Ventura always knows what 211 is. If you, does everyone here know what 211 is? 211 is a, a hotline that you can call if you're ever in distress or you need help or it's a way of getting information out. Um, I think Santa Barbara, because of the media and the uh, television um, access, has it a little bit more publicized, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. And, and you get to it by dialing 211 on your phone, so <laughs> hence, yeah. hence the tricky name, right? All right, good. Hey, let me, oh, Diana, you, you want to Yeah, say one of the things I wanted to, uh, to mention is uh, for the immigrant population is uh, they get a lot of their information from uh, the radio. Um, and so it's important, and, and unfortunately, sometimes the radio helps spread the fear. And so it's important that we get them on board to be able to uh, understand the census and to um, advertise it um, and help uh, bring people on, you know, on, on some of their talk shows and stuff to be able to uh, help the, whether it's the older immigrant population who listens a lot to the, um, uh, to the radio or even the public television, the stations that they listen to, to, to get the word out using them with a positive message um, that will help the immigrant population want to participate. So I, I didn't mention one challenge, but I, I want to put another one on the table earlier. And this next question from the audience can, reminded me of this one. So the timing of preparation for the census next year um, leading up to April 1st, is going to be right in the midst of a primary campaign season in the state of California. 
So what happens to available airtime during campaign season? Yeah, it all gets sucked up. Well, it gets sucked up by somebody else. We won't mention any names, right? So we, we recognize that this is going to be an extraordinary challenge, not just buying airtime, potentially, but also just to be heard amongst everything, all the din of the election no, election advertisement, not noise, sorry. Right? So I, I want us to continue to think about this as something going forward as another challenge. So, so what the question from the audience that prompted my memory on that um, little challenge we have, um, will we be knocking on doors in difficult to count areas? Will volunteers be carrying devices to register people? So um, let me have the panelists kind of talk through what those, the, what that kind of almost kind of get out the vote style activity. What does that look like and how, how effective do we think that will be? Well, I, I just want to add one layer, Dennis, to what you just said, which um, we saw recently with the Hill and Wolseley fire and the borderline shooting. Um, we, I had a friend who was at a sporting event and all of a sudden on the screen came a donation, donate to VCFF, the Ventura County Family Foundation. Well, there is no Ventura County Family Foundation. It's the Ventura County Community Foundation. So one of the risks also that we have to really be aware of is the, um, the potential for fraud and um, you know, devious, more um, sinister behavior. And I think that that's something that we have to really be aware of. Um, and I've seen it um, in this instance with the borderline and Hill and Wolseley fire. Um, we've had numerous examples of scams that materialized overnight. And people are aware that this is coming. It's also a national effort. So these criminal networks can be a lot more organized than just local people trying to take advantage of others. Anyway, I don't want to be fear producing, but we do need to be cognizant of this. How are we going to A, protect our volunteers? How are we going to protect our community members? And the outreach does include going you know, to our neighbors. It should be done within our communities, which is why we need to engage everyone in the effort and the complete count committees need to be representative, represented, but this is something that needs to be food for thought. So, so Diana, just real quick, I want to come on up while, while you're here. So Diane, can we get your focus group back together that you had a moment ago, the folks where you were asking about whether they'd participate, and ask them about <clears throat> well, how would they feel about somebody knocking on their door to ask the question? I mean, it seems to me one of those things that, I mean, we've gotten less neighborly. You know, we don't spend as much time on our front porches, and we grow really tall hedges here in, Cal in Santa Barbara. Um, and so it becomes a little bit more challenging. But, I mean, did, was that any part of the discussion you were having? I mean, I want to open that up to Steve and, and Pat and, and Stephanie as well. Um, so in some way, some of them were re relieved that there weren't going to be people knocking on the doors, right? Because the message out there right now for many of the immigrants is don't answer your door, especially if you don't know someone. Um, and so if we are going to send people out, I think, uh, Vanessa, when you just said, it, it needs to be people that they know, it needs to be people that they trust. And so, um, and, and how you do that in, in neighborhoods, I'm not, I'm not sure of, but um, yeah. that's, I, I, don't, I think many of them will not open doors uh, unless they know it's somebody that it's yeah. somebody that they know or trust. And, yeah. and just to clarify, um, we are um, that's not a key part of our strategy. I know that in some right. in Ventura to go door to door as volunteers. However, mm -hmm. we do know that there will be outreach, and people are going to try to reach out to their neighbors. Um, and not everyone has access to the same type of communication devices that we all have. But yeah. can tell you. So just to be clear, the. The California census are, is not the, the people that will be doing the enumeration in the county. It's the U.S. Census Bureau, and we are requiring all our contractors, whether they're counties or the ACBOs or CBOs, to part of their 11 elements for their plan is to ha have a plan within their, their jurisdiction to help us recruit people who look and sound like those people in those areas to become enumerators. 
And for the first time, unfortunately, the U.S. Census requires a citizenship requirement to be an enumerator. In previous censuses, it was not required. So we are going to count on our partners, our ACBOs and counties, to find and recruit people from their local communities to become enumerators and come and be out in the, in the community. And hopefully there's not a lot of door knocking and we get information through festivals and 211 and other ways to reach the hard to count communities and even through radio. And we're going to be requiring our contractors to have community, uh, sorry, questionnaire assistance centers and questionnaire action kiosks where people can get information about the census and or fill out the census and get some help. So those are some other places that people can come to. Uh, and we will also hopefully have community-based organizations have teams to help the members to fill out the questionnaires so that no one comes to their homes. Stay, stay for one question, because this one um, from the audience, I think you, you're gonna be in the best position to answer. So is the state of California networking with other states who also have hard to count populations um, in terms of these strategies and, and ideas? That's a good question. I don't think we are. We actually are the forefront. Uh, we are, uh, other states are looking to us because we are the only state really that has money behind. We have resources before, be, uh, for our complete count committees. There are other states that do have complete count committees, but they don't have much money. And really, we're the experts. We know our California. We know our, our citizens. And we know how to best reach our hard to count communities. Thanks. Thanks I did want to yeah. add something yes. to that. Um, I did want to add that the California legislature did uh, start a special committee uh, dedicated to the 2020 census. And so this select committee through the legislature will be partnering with, with other states and on more best practices and feedback. I don't think there's been information specifically to that, to that question, but there, the legislature is convening around this, this um, topic. Thank you. And let me just do a poll with the group that's here. Um, and so here's the question. How many of you, you're going to have two categories, how many of you feel like you're, you and your neighbors and your family, those that you regularly connect with, are very aware or not aware at all that next year is the census? So how many, how many of you feel like your family and neighbors are very aware of the census coming next spring? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's going to happen. All right, just put your hand up again. Let me just look. So, yeah, a little bit better than half. Okay. And then, so, uh, how many believe that their family neighbors are not aware of the census happening next year? Or don't care. Or don't care. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> so, some more hands went up about the don't care. Okay. Um, bureaucracies, we love them. Okay. So, let me go to a couple more of the audience questions here. Thank you for that. That's helpful for us to kind of see visually. So um, does the census need volunteers? And this kind of goes to uh, your comment a moment ago. If yes, how does a person obtain information about volunteer opportunities? So let me just say, uh, the Census Bureau itself, the federal agency that does the, you know, hires the census workers, that process is just beginning to roll out. We're going to help, um, the county is going to help publicize the job openings that are available for the enumerators, the supervisors of the enumerators, all the folks that actually are gonna do the transactional work on the behalf of the federal government. The second question, I think more at the heart of what this question was about, is if you wanted to help basically get people counted, if you wanted to align yourself with the count from Sesame Street and be part of the outreach effort, what, how would you do that? And I'm just gonna say, stay tuned. That's not a fully formed process yet, but I guarantee you we will need many hands to make light work. Uh, and we count on folks like the League to be strategic partners in this because of your interests um, and align with all of our interests. And so we look forward to um, reaching out to you again uh, somewhere in the fall where we are able to suggest here's some specific ways and you know, help you sign up on the dotted line. How's that? 
And in the meantime, be a myth buster. Learn everything you can about the census. Listen to the PBS or 60 Minutes episodes. Read the articles and help dispel all the misinformation that will be coming. That's vital. And we can all do that right now. That's good. So a couple other last questions. Uh, maybe Pat would be great on this, but maybe others might want to weigh in too. What steps are being taken to count the homeless population? That's a great question, and I'm not sure I have a, an answer to it. Um, we are, as a steering committee, just beginning to brainstorm some of the strategies that we can utilize in reaching out to the hard-to-count populations, including the homeless. So as we move forward and continue to meet and outline our, our outreach plan, uh, I think we'll have more details in the, the next month or two. Yeah, to add in, uh the Census Bureau staff are contacting um, shelters and other places where homeless might congregate to find out where those locations are. And then when the census does uh, finally arrive, there'll be special um, counts. Uh, I guess it's called um, shelter night or something like that, where they go to the shelters and then um, <clears throat> they'll go to areas where there's no shelter, but they're living in street locations. So they would have special counts for the homeless. Great. Any other thoughts, Steve? Yeah, yeah I could add, uh, through the United Way Network, um, recently there was a count that took place through the Home for Good program. Uh, so there's some information there that we hope to make available uh, to access and then also count those individuals. That's great. Okay, um, I have one more question. Um, can people submit census data online before April 1st? No. I see no. No, no. the answer's no. <laughs> But you'll get plenty of time to do it. Don't worry. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, so that wraps up all the questions and the questions I had. I just want to ask the panelists, the one thing we didn't talk about today was, and anybody can start, what's the one thing we didn't talk about today you think the folks here need to know? We could talk about money a little bit more. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, uh, in all seriousness, um, we just, we need to remember um, there are, and I know Ventura County best because that's where our numbers are, but there's a need for $5.8 million to do outreach to hard to count population and that only breaks down to $12 per hard to count person and doesn't include the senior population. So we need to start thinking what type of resources do we have in the community to either fund that gap or what can we do either with our churches or our places of faith or our school system or our nonprofits or our hairdressers? What places do we see people at that we can do re outreach to that doesn't have to be reinvented? Because we're gonna need to start finding all those places um, to leverage. And um, that's our strategy. Um, 5.8 million, we, th we think we can raise two and a half Two and a half, but um, you know that's fifty percent of what we need. Less, less than fifty percent of what we need. So we've got to we've got to work together, and that's just Ventura County. So if we work together, we can leverage those dollars even more. And and the the challenge in that is for Santa Barbara. You know we've we've got the first three fifty, right? Um, that's a really long way from, from five million, right, for Santa Barbara. But so, you also but, have some of the ACBO funding yeah. that we secured. So the percentage of the hard to count population that resides in Santa Barbara, these funds have been specifically earmarked for you, and we're gonna get the letter from the state that will help just make me feel a little bit more comfortable saying exactly what those percentages are. I just haven't gotten the document yet, but as soon as we do, I'll let Dennis know right away. Other things we didn't talk about today that we really should have? Anybody else? Can we talk about one more? <laughs> <laughs> no, Flint, Michigan. V Vanessa doesn't mind talking about this at all. No, yeah. no, Flint, Flint, Michigan. Just remember what happened in the water system in Flint, Michigan. So you remember, um, I met the Community Foundation CEO. His first week on the job was when that water crisis happened, and he had been feeding his family. Um, water, his two-year-old daughter, water, turns out had 5,700 times the amount of lead that should have been there. This is, this is something that 
affects us all. These are the examples we need to get in the news. These are the examples we need to get into the op-eds. This is how we're going to motivate people to take action. Okay, so think Flint. We don't want that here. <laughs> wow. Yes. Yes. Oh, sure. Come on up. Anybody else with th uh, last thoughts for the panel today? And, and by all means. So this is the biggest deployment outside of war. Census 2020. Biggest deployment outside of war. So we need everybody to be involved. The 2000 census, we kind of knew what we were doing. And 2010 census, we didn't have any money, any infrastructure. We in uh, the census now in 2020, we are working doubly. Not only are we building the infrastructure for 2020, and we're also building the infrastructure for 2030. Because once uh, we establish the who, what, why, and where, and we dust off all the notes, we want to know why did California do this? How did they do it? Why did they reach out to these people? So we're setting up the infrastructure for 2030, and this infrastructure that you're, you're supporting here in Santa Barbara and in Region 5 will help you be able to work together for get out the vote or other disasters or other positive things that will happen in your county. So, so I really liked what uh, you were saying about building relationships, and that's what we want. We want collaboration among everybody. So go out and talk to 10 people about the census today. Yes, yes, we have a, a raised hand. I'm just confused. I'll repeat the question. I'll repeat the question if you could do it. Oh, you got one? Oh, great. Wireless, yay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Confused about the money. Um, is that money going to pay the U.S. approved census takers, or is this money going toward the education and outreach and getting volunteers and so I forth? all the latter you know this is the marketing the outreach the volunteerism it's you know getting communications designing the materials the postage all of those type of things that are part of getting getting everyone to be counted that's what those are for yeah, yeah. And, and that's where the community and I'll just say that uh, we are meeting next week with the philanthropic organ uh, entities here in the in the city uh, to begin to, not next week, week after, to begin to really um, prime them to be a participant. Um, and we'll be talking with the local cities and as well as the county, you know, in terms of that as well. But this is really, as Vanessa just said, this is really about resources to not count people, but to get people to be counted, right? That's the key, key part of that. So did we have one, another question in the back back there? Yeah. I'm, I just wanted to ask, you talked about April 1st. Can you be very specific about what, what's after that? How long do people have to fill out this form online? And is it only online? There's no more paper form, is that correct? So again, starting in March, every, but every household will receive a card with an address and a login information. You'll get that card, I believe, three, four times. I don't have it in my head, my apologies. I can look on my computer. And that is gonna be from March through April that you'll get those cards and you can fill out, go online on your phone, telephone, or uh, on your computer, tablet to be able to do that. We are requiring our contractors where there are ACBOs and counties to have what we call a NRFU plan or NORFU, non-response follow-up. And that's from May 2020 to, to August 2020, where we, where we know that there are certain areas that have not responded. People will go out and do more events, uh, do outreach, do questionnaire assistance centers. So we can say, hey, it's not too late. It's, I know it's April, past April 1st, but you can still fill out. And so that's part of our outreach and our campaigning is like, it's not too late. You can still fill out your questionnaire. So we, and we have, we cut it up to August because the census has to collect all that data, put it together and report it to the U.S. Uh, president by uh, December 2020. But in those latter efforts, there will be paper forms available. There will be paper forms available as well. the later parts of the process. Yes, yeah. throughout the process. Yeah. And yeah. some of you need to start planning the party for August so you can celebrate your efforts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not to, not to. One more. We'll take one more here, and, and then we'll wrap up. Is there any concern about uh, duplicate, duplicating counts? And also, what about uh, citizens that live permanently in two different states? 
Yeah, uh, your, your second question, um, they ask for where you live more often than not. So if you live in two, I guess if it's six months in each state, that would be a problem, but it's usually where you live for the most uh, longest period of time during the year. And uh, the, oh, the first question was about whether duplicating households. Well, that's why there's this address list that the Census Bureau puts a lot of time and effort into uh, making sure it's up to date and there's no duplicative addresses. So basically uh, a card is sent to each housing unit and um, that they get a response from that housing unit. Uh, so if there's another response from the same unit, then they'll know it's a duplicate duplication. They can um, delete it or do whatever. They go back to it and see if there's any issues. Yeah. I'll, I'll say one of our big challenges for 2030 mm -hmm. is they're going to want a geolocated marker for every single door front, for every single unit in the set in Santa Barbara County. So just picture that for a second. So by 2030, we're going to have to provide geolocated data for every residence, basically their front door. Um, in order to be able to have an even more accurate count with the number of units behind units and everything else that we see, you know, maybe in downtown Santa Barbara, <laughs> right? So I think that's a real challenge. Yes. One. Is there a I had a question. Oh, good. Sorry. Is there a system that you guys deal with uh, where people go by uh, various aliases or uh, various names yeah. for one person or something? So again, I think it's about counting the people, not about the various names. I think they're, um, I don't know how they run a, 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 yeah, security kind of back check on that, but. So this is more of a US Census question, but they base it on household. They I wanna know in this household, how many people live? What are their ages? What's their ethnicity? So it's not about you, you know, specific name person. It's about household. So one last question and then we'll wrap up. Okay, I, I, I was a little confused about the answer uh, that you, it's where you live most of the time. I was under the impression that it's where you slept on April 1st. Is that not the case? I, I, so they're gonna, you're going to get sourced at, at multiple addresses. I, I had understood the same way you did, but I, I, I'm open to maybe clarifying that. Brian, have you? I mean, well, I have a great a source, census.gov, if you really want to get the, you know, yeah. the final word. But um, uh, you can imagine there's uh, people that might be on a vacation home April 1st, and they don't live there. They're there for, to go skiing in Mammoth, and the rest of the year they live in Orange County. So. If you think about it that way, it's really where they live most of the time and not where they're sleeping that night. Yeah, so Mammoth would get the, would get the boom and not, not Orange County, right? So let me, let me just wrap up by saying this, um, and thank you very, very much. First of all, I want to thank the panelists for all of their participation and their expertise. I really appreciate it. Secondly, I want to thank you for coming. And then I want you to note I've left my phone number that's my desk phone, um, and my email address up there on the, on the screen. Yeah, well, you, you can come closer. We'll leave it on for a minute, and you can um, come get it. I know it's a little dark. Um, but I, I want to be the point person on this effort, okay? Somebody has to be. I, I wanted to nominate Steve, but he didn't want it. Um, no, just kidding. He didn't say no. He did not say no. But, but really, you know, we need, I need to just be that point person for now. But, but as time goes on, I want to be able to, if you're interested, if you want to volunteer, if you want to do things, I'm willing to collect that information and have you be available. So I, I'm putting my hand up just to be the person that's going to be the one in kind of collecting that stuff. And again, I just want to thank the League uh, very much for this opportunity. And, um, and, and just thank you again for your participation and thanks to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.